Hello, folks. Welcome back to the second of our double bill today. And we are in the middle of El Alamein fortnight. And although a lot of the shows will be concentrating on the period that was 80 years ago, kind of this week and next week and last week, in fact, there was, of course, that progression and development of how to fight a war in the desert that had been going on since much earlier in the war. So with the use of tactical air power, to get to the point where uh, you get to the El Alamein success, you have to have gone through the earlier couple of years of things not going so well. So to take us on that journey today, uh, Dr. Mike Bechtold, who hasn't actually been on for a while, he's one of the early standout brilliant guests on World War II TV, but for whatever reason just hasn't been on for a while, is going to come on and talk about that development. So El Alamein will come in towards the end of the show, but we, it, it's all it's all pertinent stuff there. So just because I've got a few new subscribers over the last few days, thank you very much for joining us. Just to remind you how things work, please keep your comments coming in. The live, the live chat is always fun. I, I can't always keep an eye on every single comment coming in. Leaving a comment afterwards helps with the, the algorithm and sharing what we're doing on social media helps as well. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so and click the little bell so you get the notifications. But Dr. Mike Bechtold is an aviation historian as well as being a Normandy historian and all other subjects and is a fantastic map maker. So we have some brilliant maps coming your way. So I'm going to bring Mike in now. So good afternoon, Mike. How are you today? Hey, Woody. Thanks for having me back. Always uh, happy to be here and, and talk to you and your loyal followers. Well, it's great to have you. And, and with, with tactical air power, I think one of the things that tends to happen, and it happens on the sidebar even over the last few days, is rather than talking about tactics and use and leadership, it's about aircraft types. It descends into, is the Hurricane better than the P-40? And, oh, they were better at this altitude than that. And the turn rate of this, the climb rate of that. And although that is fascinating, it's it's a, it's about the tool, isn't it? And it's how you use, it's the method of using the tool and who is the, who is the, the user of the tool that is just as interesting as the actual equipment itself. So, in in your study of aviation over the years, it is a bit easy to get sucked into the kind of the aircraft types and the model types, but it's not really the story, is it? Yeah, today we're going to be talking less about the aircraft, less about the pilots, less about their individual accomplishments, and taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture, looking at the doctrine, looking at how air forces work, how they change, how they evolve what goes right, what doesn't go right, and how that plays into uh, a, a successful campaign at the uh, the front of the the uh, the battlefield. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about some people. We're gonna talk about um, some battles, and mostly, and and I think it's gonna be very true to my title. We're gonna look at the evolution of mm. tactical air power in North Africa. Brilliant. Well, I'll load up your screen so we're ready to go. And you're in charge of everything. And we, and because Mike is a map guy, he's got his uh, the screen sharing rather than using the app uploaded stuff, so he can point with his mouse at the details on the map. So, um, over to you, Mike. And in terms of questions, folks, if they're kind of pertaining to exactly what we're discussing on screen, we'll do them as we go along. If they're kind of broader questions about the use of fire, tactical air power beyond North Africa, or 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 questions about, I don't know, Mike's favorite aircraft. If you want to do that, we can do that at the end, folks. So over to you, Mike, and we'll we'll, we'll sit back and learn something. Great. Thanks, Woody. Now, I've got a, an eye on the, uh, the, the comment panel, and uh, I'll try to uh, answer any questions as they come up. But if I miss them, um, don't fret. Uh, Woody will be uh, keeping me appraised of anything keen. If it's something that uh, applies uh, directly to what I'm talking about, I'm happy to slow down and, and address it. But if it's something that's going to take us down uh, one of Woody's favorite uh, rabbit holes, then we, we'll we can do the one or two rabbit holes. It's just okay. when you get into a complete warren of them. You All right, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll make that happen then. And uh, anything else we can address at the end. But what I what I want to talk to you today about is is that evolution of tactical air power of how we got from. Uh, a system that was relatively dysfunctional at the start of the war to a, a system that was very advanced and very effective in, in certain ways by the time we got to Normandy and, and Northwest Europe. And it's all on a continuum. And we're going to look at the, the, the Western desert portion of it. There were also developments that are taking place in England and as a result of the Battle of France 1940 as well. And they're all happening in parallel. It's kind of a little bit difficult to figure out 
which influence was the most important. But I, I tend to look at the Western Desert as as paramount because it was operational experience. It was taking place on the battlefield. It was against the Italians and then the Germans, and they figured out what worked, what didn't work, and how to make it work going forward. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that evolution today. And uh, for me, the the most important. Um, guy in this whole discussion is Raymond Collishaw. And, and I'm sure that's a name that's going to come out of left field for some of you. Um, Raymond Collishaw was the, the individual that I did my uh, doctoral dissertation on looking at his evolution as an, uh, as an aviator, as a, a pilot, as a commander. He's a Canadian. He was born in Nanaimo, BC in uh, 1896 or 1894, um, flew with the Royal Naval Air Service in the First World War, was one of the great aces of the Great War, 60 kills, uh, made him uh, second to uh, to Billy Bishop for Canadian aces, uh, fourth or fifth on the list of, of Allied aces overall. Really, really excellent pilot, skilled, long-lasting. Um, I think what makes him stand out in the First World War is the fact that he was as good a commander, as good a leader of men as he was a pilot and his abilities in shooting down other aircraft and, and surviving at the front. Um, and that makes him very different than a lot of other commanders. Uh, Billy Bishop, who I mentioned, is a great example of that. Outstanding pilot, um, great at what he did, a hunter as he's been described, but he really was not a good commander. He, uh, I'm not quite sure I would say failed miserably when he was given command of a squadron, but it really didn't go well. Kalashaw, by comparison, excelled at squadron command, uh, commanded another squadron in South Russia against the Bolsheviks. Um, kind of interesting for what's going on today because he was fighting in, in uh, Crimea and in um, that part of um, uh, Russia and Ukraine that is forefront in the news today. Um, went on to uh, fight in, in the Middle East in the interwar years, was a, a wing commander aboard a Royal Naval Aircraft Carrier. And at the start of the Second World War, he was the senior operational commander in the Western Desert, commanding uh, 202 Group. So he was the man that was overseeing those early battles against first the Italians and then the Germans uh, before he was replaced and, and uh, a guy named uh, Arthur Conningham took over, a, a New Zealander. Uh, Maori, Mary, as his nickname was, and we'll, we'll talk about him as well. But I've got a, a quotation from uh, Kalashaw's memoirs up on the screen there for you. And I, I find this is really quite remarkable because, as you know from what I've just told you, he was an extremely successful First World War ace. And you would think that that would be what he would be most proud of. That would be what sustained him, what he thought about most when he's looking back and reflecting on his career. But that's not the case. As you can see, he says, I feel that my days of command in North Africa in 40 and 41, when we had to outwit and outfight a numerically superior enemy by a combination of deception, superior tactics and fighting spirit, represent by far my best effort. So that, that was probably the quote that got me thinking about him the most. Holy crap, we've got this great ace, and this is what he thinks is the most important part of his career? Why is that? And that really led me down the, the path of, of examining his Second World War career and trying to figure out what was going on. So what I'm, what I'm going to talk to you mostly about today is that period from uh, 1940 into 1941, where the RAF is really figuring out how to do close air support, how to do tactical air support and figure out what worked and what, what didn't work. So that's, uh, that's where we're, we're going today. Um, so the early war in the Western desert, um, started in, in June, 1940, uh, the Italians didn't attack until then. And, uh, when they did finally attack, it was really hesitant, uh, halting. They didn't go very far. They didn't push all the way to Alexandria or, or deep into Egypt, like the British thought they were. So they kind of ceded the battlefield to the British and, and the British were having a, a tough time of it. Um, you know, everything else that's going on in, in 1940 um, at this point, uh, Battle of France, uh, Battle of Britain is getting underway, things like that. Uh, the desert isn't the British uh, primary focus of what's going on. They've got forces there, but they're not frontline forces. They're kind of leftovers and remnants. Um, the RAF is, um, they've, they've got a, a fair number of squadrons, but they're all obsolete aircraft. They're 
uh, Gloucester Gladiators is the frontline fighter, uh, a biplane that wouldn't have been out of place on the Western Front in, in 1918. Well, don't tell the people of Malta that, Mike. <laughs> well, the, the Gloucester Gladiator is is a great aircraft when it's used properly um, against uh, peer or near peer competitors. Mm. I'm, I'm not I'm not putting it down. I guess that comment comes out more from the point of if you want to fight a, a Gladiator against a, a ME109 or a yeah. FW190, yeah. then you're going to have problems. And uh, I know the the 190s weren't on uh, on the table quite yet. But uh, the Gloucester Gladiator was definitely a second-line fighter by 1940, any way you slice Absolutely. it. And uh, frankly, they were they were fighting second-line fighters. The Italians had uh, a biplane fighter that there was their main um, opposition as well. So you have these uh, great uh, dogfights, um, tangles in the air that, uh, like I say, would have been uh, not out of place in the First World War. Um, but the Italians didn't take the initiative. They had the numbers. They had way more troops than the, the British. They had way more aircraft. And if they pushed, if they'd been aggressive, they probably could have taken the British out of uh, the Mediterranean at this point in the war, which would have been huge, but they didn't. And uh, the British under General Wavell uh, prepared a, a counter-strike, Operation Compass, that was meant really just to push the Italians back from the... Uh, uh, back out of the Western desert, back across the uh, the border into Cyrenaica, uh, that province of, of Libya. But it it succeeded beyond all expectations. The uh, the Italians were surprised, they were overwhelmed. And a, a big part of the, the British success was how Collishaw handled the RAF at this point. He used them aggressively. He used them uh, in a smart way, that uh, in a way that the Italians weren't doing it. The Italian army had uh, a strong say in how the Italian Air Force was operated. And they said, we want an air umbrella. We want to see aircraft over our head protecting us all the time. And that's what the Italian Air Force did. But that's a really poor use of resources, especially when you don't have too many aircraft. So the RAF was able to avoid those aircraft. They wouldn't go into spots where the Italian Air Force was. And and probably an even bigger thing with the air umbrella is that for all those hours, all those flight hours, where you're flying those umbrella missions, looking for the enemy, trying to prevent them from attacking your frontline troops. Um, they're not doing something more useful. They're not supporting their army. They're not attacking lines of communications. They're not doing all those things that air power can do very well in supporting an army on the battlefield. So you've lost that advantage. And, and that's what the Italians were doing. Um, Kalashaw saw that very clearly and he uh, resisted calls from uh, Wavell and other army commanders to say, well, we want an air umbrella. And he had to say to them, that's not the best thing for us to do. So instead he was using his air power offensively. He was attacking Italian ports. He was attacking lines of communications. He was doing a little bit of uh, attacking on the battlefront, uh, the kind of stuff the army really wanted to see. But for the most part, he was avoiding that because he knew that wasn't a profitable use of his air force. Um, he was working very closely with the Navy um, I love this term. He uh, was often flying what were called fumig fumigation raids. Um, so when a, a Royal Navy convoy or, or fleet would uh, be getting close to the, the, um, the coast, he would send his aircraft out to attack Italian air bases to, uh, and this is a direct quote, keep the pests down, uh, fumigate them. And uh, so worked really closely with the uh, the Navy to make that happen. And uh, I, I think you probably know the the story of, um, Operation Compass, that first attack was very successful. Uh, I'll show you a picture of the Italian uh, prisoners of war that were captured, but they were in the, the tens of thousands. And one uh, British Army officer was asked for how many uh, prisoners were captured. And he thought about it for a moment and said, uh, well, ab about five acres of officers and about 200 acres of other ranks, <laughs> which is uh, wow. quite the uh, the estimate, but it gives you an idea of how many uh, Italians were being captured in this operation. Um, oops, sorry, went the wrong way. The uh, the attack on on Bardia, which is a, a small little port just inside the uh, the Libyan border from Egypt, is uh, really an absolute model of uh, cooperation between not just the army and the air force, but the navy as well. The, uh, the Italians had a really strong position carved out there. They had uh, put in strong defensive lines all around the port, 
like you can see on the screen there, those gray areas are their defended zones. They had wire, they had trenches, they had minefields. It was all coordinated with artillery that was in uh, in behind the circles. Um, inside the perimeter are strong points that the Italians had set up as uh, fallback positions, as uh, a second line of, of um, resistance. And it was a really tough pickle. And, and the Italians said, there's no way the British are, are going to get in here. So the British, of course, got in. And, and in fact, it wasn't the British. It was the Australians. The Australian 6th Division was, was given the lead in this operation. And they, uh, they picked their spots. They uh, attacked through and uh, then expanded out once they were through the main lines of defense. But none of this could have happened without absolutely close support from the Royal Navy, who had uh, the, the monitor, um, I think it was Roberts, and some battleships and, and other big ships that were uh, pounding the Italian positions with uh, 14, 15, 16-inch uh, shells, and the Air Force that was uh, providing close support, um, trying to knock out those artillery batteries, but perhaps even more importantly, um, keeping the Italians from uh, conducting reconnaissance, seeing what's going on behind British lines. They were attacking um, Italian airfields and making sure the Italian Air Force couldn't uh, interfere. They were flying spotting missions for the Air Force, for the Navy, sorry, to direct their guns. Uh, they were flying spotting missions for the Royal Artillery to, uh, to uh, adjust their fall of shot. And it, it really is a case of this is a battle that probably should have gone the Italians way, but the British, and I'm sorry, I keep saying British, I know it's the Australians and, and uh, a bunch of others are doing this um, really well coordinated and they cracked it through in about three days, uh, two days to, to, to get it done. And then all of a sudden they've captured another great big uh, Italian bastion that uh, the Italians thought wouldn't fall and they could use it as the center of um, their continued fighting against the British. So it's uh, it's a battle that I think wouldn't have been won without air power and uh, Kalashaw was was key in doing that. Um, Operation Compass continued after the fall of, of Bardia. Um, they captured uh, Tobruk, which is right there with another uh, operation that was very similar to Bardia. Tobruk had a uh, defensive perimeter and uh, not quite as much naval support in doing it, but the RAF was key in, in getting to Brook to fall for the first time. And then it was just a route, a race, as the Italians streamed in retreat back to, uh, uh, well, out of Cyrenaica, and the British were tracing them, trying to catch them. And it all uh, came to a head here at uh, Betta Farm, which is where the, uh, uh, I believe it was 7th Armored Division, outraced the uh, the Italians, got ahead of them, put in a blocking position and stopped them. And that was essentially the end of, of Operation Compass and uh, really uh, an absolutely great uh, victory, uh, an early victory. But it it's one that also often gets poo-pooed because, uh, of course, it was against the Italians. It wasn't against the Germans. The Italians were uh, not great soldiers. They didn't fight well. They retreated easily. You've heard all of the uh, the Italian uh, army jokes, which I'm not going to repeat here. And I mean, th those kind of things happen for a reason. Those jokes come for a reason, but I, I think they really sell the Italians short. And uh, I, I think it also sells the, the British and the RAF short in this battle mm. as well. Um, because... I mean, to just to jump in, I think with the, with the Italians, I think it's doing a disservice to the learning curve in that I think the perception of the, of the Italians being so bad is that what could the Allies have possibly learned from those guys? They 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 were they were doing everything so badly. But you know, as has been pointed out quite often, we've got Giulio on next week talking about the Italian role. Is they did some things really quite well, and mm -hmm. they were hampered by, as you said, the army controlling the air force and the government controlling the army. So they were kind of two hands tied behind their back. And, and and poor equipment, but in many ways they they outpunched uh, for their size, or their, their size were good. They they out they they were they were quite good, and I think College Shaw's learning from the Italians needs to be addressed. You know because it, it, they were doing some things well, but we've got the question up on screen. I put it there from Jeff about did he did College Shaw develop the use of forward air controllers? Um, no, not forward air controllers, not in the way we'd see with uh, like a Rover David or, or something like that in, in Normandy. They just didn't have the equipment. They didn't have the the, the systems to make that happen. One thing that um, I'll, I'll say now in case I don't say it later is that it's important to uh, remember that, like, like I already said, they were very small forces 
in this point that Kalashaw had under his control. They were outdated or, or obsolete aircraft, and they were just getting by with a bare minimum. And mm. what Kalashaw accomplished is is absolutely uh, amazing given the numbers he had he kind of um he was aggressive i love the the example early on he had um just one hurricane uh which was uh, the most modern aircraft flying in in the theater and uh it was nicknamed collie's battleship because he used it as a force multiplier he uh, flew it with um a couple of uh, Blenheims that were turned into fighters by having uh, machine guns added to them and uh he would keep rotating pilots and keep it in the air as as much as he could and all over the front. So the Italians thought there was a whole squadron or squadrons of, of this uh, uh, excellent aircraft when it was really just one, but he just was using it very aggressively. And um, it, it was a great, brilliant use of, of that one aircraft. So that's uh, something to, to keep in mind um, when we talk about the later battles that um, Tedder and, and Conningham had. Uh, we can't forget the absolute wealth of material they had, uh, more squadrons, more transport, more support, more radios, more radar, uh, better aircraft, uh, Spitfires and Mosquitoes and, and um, things like that, that comparing the early period to the, the later period has to keep into effect all of those kind of things as well. And I, I think sometimes it, it gets lost. So, well, here's a couple pictures for uh, the, the, the gearheads out there. The uh, squadron of, uh, or the flight of hurricanes at the top were some of the early models that were uh, getting into the desert. Uh, a couple photos of destroyed Italian aircraft that were found at air bases as the, uh, the British overran them. Um, and then a photo of the Italian prisoners that had been captured during this period. Big problem the Italians had during this period was uh, maintenance, that they should have been better at it. They were close to Italy. They should have been able to keep their aircraft in the air, repaired, and things like that. But they had really low service serviceability rates, uh, which hampered them. And those low serviceability rates meant that they lost absolutely enormous uh, quantities of aircraft as the British advanced and captured the airfield because the, the aircraft might be missing a, a bolt or, or some small part, but they couldn't move it. And so it was captured virtually intact as uh, the British moved forward. So ha helped with the, uh, the bag or the, the equipment that went into the bag. So the next part, and I just want to talk about this, um, Briefly, I'm not going to get into the details of, of Greece and Crete, but it's really important because as uh, failures, as routes of the British Army, well, you know, again, it's the uh, Aussies and, and New Zealanders, especially that bore the brunt of it. But with the end of, of Operation Compass, there was a, a debate um, amongst the, the commanders, Wavell and, and Collishaw and others. Longmore was the senior RAF commander for the Middle East for the Mediterranean. And uh, the question was, what do we do now that we've succeeded with Compass? Do we pause and consolidate or do we keep going and, and drive the Italians right out of, of Italy, or sorry, out of North Africa, out of Libya? And uh, Kalashaw was very much of the, the opinion that we need to keep pushing and, and keep after the Italians while they're, they're running. But uh, he was overruled and uh, the decision was made to stop the British troops. And then this decision was made to take the troops out and use them in Greece and uh, counter the, I can't remember the exact timeline, if they were in there before the Germans landed or if they were moved in response to the German invasion of Greece. But uh, large numbers of troops and RAF units were pulled out of the desert and put into Greece. And of course that campaign didn't go really well. The, the Germans pushed uh, the, the British right out, uh, sent them back to Crete and then uh, the capture of Crete, that Pyrrhic victory by the uh, German paratroopers in, in capturing the island. But uh, what, what's important from our perspective is the view of the RAF during these battles because the army was very unhappy, very loud, very vocal about the lack of support they received from the RAF. They felt that the RAF wasn't doing enough of a job. They uh, were... Um, 
bothered by the, the constant attacks by the Luftwaffe, especially Stukas on their positions, and they're constantly calling for uh, their own air umbrella to protect them from these uh, air attacks. And so the RAF came out of uh, Greece and, and, and Crete with a really um, bad reputation. Uh, RAF was um, said to stand for rare as fairies or uh, royal absent force, and uh, the army was very um, disappointed with the support it received. And that went all the way up to the top, um, to politicians, to uh, Churchill, the uh, New Zealand prime minister was particularly um, animated about the lack of support his troops had received from the RAF. And, and so what was a uh, tactical operational issue became a strategic political issue. Mm -hmm. And it's one that's going to have a big role to play in uh, the forthcoming Operation Battle Axe, because it's going to drive the way the RAF is used in that battle. So, uh, and was well, just to ask you a question: Were there were there claims of there was no support c completely unfounded, or was it back to this idea of the fact that the ground commanders wanted this kind of umbrella support, and what they actually were doing was 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 being used elsewhere? So, I mean, is there was there some some truth in what the claims were that there was? Or um, was it misunderstanding really that, that's a really good question and, and, and i'll i'll be a, a true academic and hedge my bet on this one um and say <laughs> yes and no um it, it was such an ad hoc battle and the raf was sort of making things up as they go finding airfields uh setting up operating bases making sure they had enough fuel and and uh ammunition and, and everything like that and then the, the types of aircraft, again, was largely uh, obsolete. They were fighting uh, a stronger foe in, in the Luftwaffe at this point. So in some cases, they were overmatched. Um, and there just wasn't enough of the Air Force to do what needed to be done. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the Army, and, and we'll see this over and over again, we see this today, that the Army isn't happy with the Air Force unless they can see them in the sky over yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Um, if the RAF is doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is doing interdiction, uh, flying well beyond the battlefield, that's when it's having the most effect on the battlefront. But if the uh, the soldier doesn't see it, then it's a problem. And yeah, I mean, I just go down, go down a, a rabbit hole I, after that. One of the first shows we did about tactical air power in Normandy, I went through a lot of my books and I found out that even some allied divisional commanders in Normandy were grumbling about air power and not understanding what air power was actually doing. So I thought if they don't really get, have a grasp on what the ninth air force and the second tactical air force are doing, then no wonder the GIs, Tommies and Canadians at the bottom have no idea what's going on. So I yeah. can only assume that three, two years earlier, um, you know, it, it officers were getting this feeling ground officers from the, the men below them that where the bloody hell are the air force again and it kind of it filters upwards that 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 kind of reaction yeah i i was at a um uh, a conference at uh, cfb trenton one of our big air bases about 15 years ago and uh, the topic was airland integration and it was from the first world war right through to the present and there was a bunch of uh Air Force and Army officers that were involved in in Afghanistan and, and things like that, and I, I was I just sat back and was shaking my head because the conversations and debates that the current Army and Air Force officers were having about what we need, what we don't need, how we need you to do it, it, it could have been conducted in in 1918 or, or 1940 or, or 1945. Uh, because the same debate is is happening today amongst our our militaries, and uh, it's like I'd like to think they're they're learning and, and growing, but somehow it seems like these lessons don't really impact the way they they need to. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the RAF was was and and I mean I, I guess in Crete the problem was distance. The reason I included yeah. this map is it's showing those distances. They uh, lost the airfields early on, so RAF support is coming from um across the, the med and uh it means there's not much time on target it means that they can get there especially the fighters they can get there they've got a few minutes and then they have to go back um the blenheims and, and wellingtons had a little bit longer uh loiter time but not a lot and so there wasn't a lot that the raf could do over crete so it was the the germans that had the uh the advantage there so in uh, June, so well, okay, just to make sure everybody's clear with what's going, the uh, the Germans uh, made their way over to North Africa in this period in uh, April, 
March, April, and uh, the British were still holding the line just south of, of Betafam. And uh, the Germans eventually decided they were going to attack. Um, their initial attack was supposed to be just a small little feeler attack, but the British just completely crumbled. Uh, there wasn't very many troops there. Most of them had been pulled off for uh, Greece, and the ones that were there were uh, not battle tested. And uh, the German uh, probe turned into a, a rout of the British. The British started flowing back. Rommel who was the commander on the ground now started uh, pushing, throwing more troops in. And the next thing you know, the, uh, the Germans have, have captured Tobruk and they're all the way back to the Egyptian border. And most of those gains from Operation Compass are gone. So now the, the goal is for, and I mean, the, the battles in North Africa are this to and froing for the entire length of, of the war back and forth. And now it's up to the British to start pushing again. So they're at the, the frontier. The goal is to relieve uh, Tobruk. Sorry, Tobruk hadn't been captured. It had been um, surrounded. The uh, the British, the Australians were, were in Tobruk holding that perimeter still. Uh, Rommel tried to capture it, but he couldn't. And uh, uh, the British tried a, an attack called uh, Brevity in mid-June. That was a small probing attack towards uh, Tobruk that failed. And a month later, on June fifth, sorry, July fifteenth, they, uh, sorry, June, I'm getting my dates wrong. May fifteenth was brevity. Uh, June fifteenth is Operation Battle Axe, and this is a bigger attack meant to relieve the uh, the port of uh, Tobruk. And uh, Churchill's put a lot of stock in this. He has uh, sent a, a Tiger convoy with uh, some some of his last reserves of tanks. Uh, he uh, called them his his Cubs, his Tiger Cubs. And uh, had put a lot of faith in uh, in this attack as relieving Tobruk and, and sort of regaining the initiative. So the the background that we just talked about of, of Greece and Crete really played itself into this battle because uh, Tedder, who is now the he's replaced Longmore, he is Kalashaw's uh, commander in the Middle East, uh, Arthur Tedder, who would go on to be one of the great commanders of uh, the RAF in, in the Second World War and in the post-war period, um, orders Kalashaw to do exactly the opposite of what had been successful up until that point. Uh, he tells Kalashaw that he needs to protect the army, that he needs to make sure that the Germans and the Italians cannot get at the army. So you're going to devote the majority of your aircraft to defensive air umbrella flights. And uh, Kalashaw goes along with it, but he's very clear that he's doing this under protest, that this is not the way to do it. This is not how it's been uh, done successfully in the past. But, um, and, and I, I haven't quite figured out, um, Portal, who is the uh, chief of the air staff in London, has a, a very close relationship with with Tedder. Um, he got Tedder appointed in the first place. He uh, defends Tedder and sort of pulls his uh, butt out of the fire a few times when he uh, probably should have been fired or could have been fired. And uh, he sends a he sends a message to to Tedder that's saying basically that the situation in London is that the army is unhappy with the uh, RAF and you have to do everything you can to avoid a greater rupture in relations. And Tedder interprets that as an order to create these air umbrellas. Right. Um, and I, I think it's really one of Tedder's great failings in, in the war. I think he could have interpreted that in a way of making sure you provide the best support to the area, uh, to the army as possible. Um, but he decides to play it safe. And part of me thinks that Tedder might have been enough of a uh, political creature that he followed the orders, knew it was going to be a failure, and maybe wanted it to be a favor so he could then turn around and say to the army, see, this is what happens when we do it your mm. way, and we're not going to do it this way anymore. Um, but I, I think that's giving Tedder a little bit too much credit, and I, I don't think he would purposely fail um, and, and risk a, a major battle like this. But it's interesting because later on in, in Tedder's career, he, he, he is the master of keeping the political side of things going. And that is why he's there in, in Eisenhower's team for his ability, his diplomacy ability, as much as his grasp of, of the air side of things. But it's interesting that two years earlier, he's, 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 he's maybe making a decision about the air that is based purely on the politics going on behind the scene. And it's, 
it's it, you know all of these figures, Tedder and uh, and others, are, are developing their as Montgomery will be on the ground later on, developing their skills and tactics and 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 outlooks that. And I suppose they do. Sometimes you have to get it wrong before you get it right. I don't know because because Tedder yeah. is Tedder's very popular. I mean, Paul Beaver, the RAF historian, is a massive great Tedder fan. Um, and I can see where they're coming from, but yeah, when you, you when you outline it like this, it's it, it, there's there's not much to say that, other than it's the wrong decision. Yeah, Tedder Tedder's lucky he survived this period. Um, mm. I I'm a big Tedder fan from sort of '42 on, um, but I I think he failed miserably here. It's clear that he hated Kalashaw. Um, yeah. He, uh, he titled his uh, memoirs With Prejudice, and I, I think With Prejudice is directed entirely against Kalashaw. He, um, and and I, I can't trace the route of, or the root of, of that uh, animosity. I, I suspect that something happened between them in the interwar period. I mean, Tedder is kind of that uh, academic, bookish, pipe mm, smoker. Mm, uh, mm, Kalashaw mm. was the brass brush uh, fighter pilot. Uh, the life of the mess, the last last one to leave the mess, and I, I suspect there was some encounter where Kalisha annoyed or or uh, pissed off Tedder at some point, and that stuck with them because the the interwar RAF was so small that everybody crossed paths all the time. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. And uh, when when Tedder showed up in in North Africa, he showed up in oh, late 1940, I think just before uh, uh, Compass kicked off. And he immediately wanted to get rid of, of Kalashaw and um, uh, Longmore, who was the senior commander at that point, um, said, no, Kalashaw is far too important to me. He's doing a fantastic job and there's no way we're getting rid of him. And I think Tedder just bided his time until he was able to do it. And once he, uh, once Tedder replaced Longmore, it was just a matter of time until uh, he, uh, he kicked Kalashaw out. So, Getting back to uh, um, Battle Axe, uh, it kicks off on the 15th of June, and uh, it, it's kind of like fighting with one arm behind your back because the RAF, which had been so integral to all those victories for the British in the Western Desert up until that point, are acting in almost exclusively a defensive role. And uh, the, the army does okay in its initial assaults, but where it really gets into trouble is when the Germans react and start sending uh, reinforcements there. And these reinforcements are coming across open desert out of known concentration areas that could have easily been interdicted, slowed, hit, stopped, destroyed by uh, RAF strikes. But that doesn't happen because that's not what the RAF is doing. Um, so by the, the 16th, two days in, it's clear the operation is, is failing. Um, Churchill back in London is is reading all the uh, the intelligence reports um, almost in real time, and he can see that failure is coming, and he's asking questions about what's going on, why is this happening, and then finally he says, why is the RAF not acting in an offensive role? And uh, um, uh, Portal reaches out to Tedder and says, you need to to change how you're doing things, and so you see that. Uh, most immediate concentrate on ground strafing uh, memo that comes out on the 17th. And it changes the nature of the battle in the sense that the Germans were on the verge of, of victory. They were on the verge of probably trapping and uh, destroying in detail the entire British force. But when uh, Kalashaw's fighters especially are freed, it uh, disrupts the Germans enough that the British are able to uh, extricate themselves and, and prevent a, a complete failure of that battle. So it uh, if, I, if I say that um, Battle Axe is perhaps the most important battle in the development of air support in the Second World War, I don't think that's putting too fine a point on it. And I'll, I'll explain why, because it, uh, it marks a clear break between the RAF knowing what to do and what works well, and then all of a sudden doing the exact opposite, having it fail and it would spur the highest level uh, debates, uh, discussions, and orders that would force uh, a change that wouldn't go back on for the uh, the rest of of the war. And I just want to kind of underline that statement you made there, because that's 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 some claim, Mike. You know, considering 
the relative small size of the Desert Air Force compared to, I suppose, by this point, 42. This is when in the UK and the, in the, in the, the air training you know, program in Canada, we're, we're pumping out air crews by the, by the dozen now. The aircraft types are increasing. You would, you would maybe think that there's more of an influence from, this, from the UK and, and these bases of, of where air, air power is going than actually the, the my I'm not I'm using the kind of devil's advocate language the minor backwater of North Africa but you're saying it's it's well, there is, is is where the influence is coming from yeah and and I mean you have to understand that there's this constant debate um, argument between the army and the air force it's been going on since the dawn of air power going yeah. back to the first world war and the army wants control of the air force they want to treat it like they treat the artillery in that it's just another tool in their toolbox and they want it uh, distributed in, in penny packets. Ideally, a, a brigade or, or certainly a division commander should have a squadron or squadrons assigned directly to him to do what he wants to do with them on the battlefield. And uh, the Air Force recognizes and has long recognized going back to the First World War, going back to Kalashaw's experience at uh, Amiens in, in the last hundred days, that that wasn't the best use of air power. Air power was was most valuable when it's um, freed from its uh, link to the army to do things to uh, to act beyond the battlefield or beyond the army's battlefield in interdiction, in finding and hitting targets that they can find and hit easily because doing close air support, finding the kind of targets that the army wants them to hit is really, really hard. And it was hard for the entire course of the Second World War. Being able to find those artillery positions, frontline troop positions, it's difficult. And even if you can find them, then you have to hit them. And then you have to make sure that you're not hitting your own troops in the process. Mm. It's very tough to tell uh, German from Italian, from British, from Australian, from the uh, the heights and speeds that the Air Force are operating at. So the Air, the Air, the Air Force didn't want to do close to air support for the most part because it was too difficult. It was not the thing they were good at. And there were other things they were better at. So this was uh, sort of that seminal battle where it really became clear um, what they did well and what they didn't do well. And it led to some some changes being made. So in the uh, the aftermath of, of the failure of, of Battle Axe, there was really intense discussions, uh, both in uh, the Western Desert between the RAF and the Army, and all the way back to uh, London at the, the highest levels. Uh, Chiefs of Staff, Churchill, were getting involved. Um, Auchinleck, who is the, uh, the Army commander in North Africa by this point, is trying to make a plea, a ploy, a grab for getting the RAF under his complete control. You can see his uh, uh, two essentials are listed here on the screen. First essential was more armor. Second essential was for uh, a large and well-trained air component um, to be under his control. Um, and he says, this is non-existent. Well, if there's ever fighting words um, coming from the army towards the Air Force, well, this is it. And it it set off uh, large alarm bells. Um, Tedder knew what this battle was. And I think... This is kind of the point where Tedder, Tedder starts to shine. He's not quite out of the woods yet, but he uh, goes back to uh, to London for uh, talks with uh, Portal and ultimately Churchill. And uh, Churchill, who was behind that um, directive on the eve of a battle axe that led to Portal telling um, uh, Tedder that he needs to make the army happy, um, goes uh, sort of 180 degrees and we see this um, comment coming from him in response to what Auchinleck was saying uh, because Churchill is 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 looking at battle acts and he's seeing what worked and he's seeing what didn't work and uh, he's he's already starting to solidify in his mind that the Air Force way of doing things is better than the Army way of doing things and uh, about a, a month and a half later two months later uh, we get this quote, which is probably the very most important quote that Churchill issues on the direction of uh, tactical air support in the course of the war. And uh, we can almost uh, gauge it to uh, there's the, the before period and then there's the after period. And uh, once Churchill had, had issued this proclamation, um, the army would would bluster and say things about getting the Air Force under control again. But it was never going to happen, and it made sure that uh, 
the idea that the role of the Air Force to do air umbrella and protect the troops was in the distant past. It would never be uh, approached again. And going forward, the Army and the Air Force had to work closely together, but the Army had to listen to the Air Force uh, as the expert in that realm of battle. Mm. Got an interesting question, kind of provocative question from from regular viewer uh, Gary about about the German tactics, and your you know your your comment that battle axe is is the seminal moment in the in the development of the Allied tactics. But he's saying if that's the case, how did you explain that the series that the, that series of major German victories that did not use the doctrine favoured by the RAF, and is it it's because what works for the Allies isn't necessarily going to be work for the Germans and vice versa? Yeah, it, it, I think it's a really complex task. The Luftwaffe was a very different creature. It was under army control the entire war. It was essentially a tactical air force. It didn't have a strategic arm. I mean, the, the bombers that took place in, uh, took part in the Battle of Britain doing strategic bombing were really just tactical bombing bombers being repurposed. Um, and the entire basis of the Luftwaffe was very different. But... I don't think you can isolate what the Luftwaffe did in those early victories from overall German doctrine. Um, in in the same way that in, in Normandy, I know uh, John Train has said that air power was the decisive factor in the Normandy campaign. And I, I think I have a lot of respect for John Train. I think he's written some of the, the most uh, powerful uh, texts on, on uh, air power, but I think he's completely wrong in that. I think air power is an essential tool for the Allied victory, but it's uh, more like a, a symphony that um, air power is is the, uh, the 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 tubas, and you still need the, the strings and the the woodwinds and everything like that performing together in harmony for victory. And one isn't more important than the other. Um, in in terms of the uh, the the Luftwaffe, the Luftwaffe did things differently, and I, I think it's difficult to compare. It was certainly a, a comparison that was brought up repeatedly when the RAF was trying to figure things out and when the a British Army was saying, well, look, this is the way the Luftwaffe does it. Why aren't we doing it this way? But I think the, the total situation is so different that it is difficult to have a sort of a one-for-one -one comparison on it. This is, this is like the discussion that came up with Cedric on Monday and with John Parshall about Montgomery. I know we're talking about air power, is that Montgomery did not try and do what the Germans did. He did what the 8th Army could do and let the Germans do what they did well and hope that would play into how his own tactics would would, yeah. would best them. So I think you could kind of take that across to the air war and say is that it's, bet it's better for the Allies to develop their own way of winning the war and not be bothered about, about necessarily what the enemy are doing, although it, there are these lessons learned from the Italians about how not to do things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, the, the Stuka is the aircraft that's always uh, pulled up as the uh, sort of the, the the exemplar of, of the way to do close air support. Yeah. And, and I, I would say, no, the, the Stuka can be exceptional in a small range of missions, but uh, when the allies were operating at their highest uh, using fighter bombers and typhoons and spitfires and thunderbolts, um, the, the, the Stuka doesn't even compare in terms of its flexibility. It's yeah. able to uh, impact the battlefield. So it's, it's comparing apples and oranges. Okay. Fine. All right. So that that has kind of given us the, the, the grounding, the basis to understand what's going on going forward. Um, Crusader is the, the next major operation. And in Crusader's a really interesting battle. And it's one that I would love to uh, write a book on, uh, focusing right on the, uh, the air power aspects of it, because it's very complex. There's a lot of different things going on. It marks the point where um, Cunningham takes over from Collishaw. Tedder's finally able to, to fire him. He kind of gives him a backhanded compliment and and sends him back to England. You've been out here for five years. You've done enough. It's time for a rest. But really, Tedder, if he could have done it sooner, he would have done it. So Kalashaw is sent off. Um, his um, It's not linked directly to the failure of Battle Axe, um, but that is kind of... Um, Tedder is almost blaming... Uh, Kalashoff for battle axe. He's not taking the blame for the early failures himself. Uh, he brings in Conningham and he says all these things about Conningham as if they set him aside from Kalashoff, but 
really there's not a lot of difference between the two of them. The biggest difference is that um, Cunningham is taking over at a point where British strength is growing at mm. a point when they've got more of everything. Like I was saying, more aircraft, more squadrons, more modern aircraft and, and things like that. So Cunningham's often pointed to as the uh, person who really created the allied air support system that would, um, sort of be used for the rest of the war, not just by the, the British, but by the Americans as well. Um, but I, I would argue that the system he inherited from Collishaw was about 75 to 80% formed. Right. And uh, sort of all the ideas had been uh, developed, proven in battle um, and everything like that. And what Conningham brought to the table were refinements, um, improving the uh, uh, forward air controllers, improving the ability to move squadrons forward as they're uh, advancing across the desert, uh, improving the, the repair and um, uh, logistics tail of the Air Forces. And a, a lot of that is, is that factor of having those resources available to be able to do it and not having to uh, to do everything on a, a shoestring budget. So Cunningham has sort of been credited with this, but like I said, I, I really think that he inherited an almost fully formed system from uh, Kalashaw's time. So in, in uh, Crusader, we see, and I've just highlighted these points because they are so important in how we understand tactical air support in the Second World War. Um, Tedder's plan is very different from Battle Axe. No more air umbrellas here, are there? We see them gaining air superiority, and that doesn't mean defensive patrols. That means going out and attacking the air force, uh, the enemy air force at its root, attacking enemy air bases, um, attacking its logistics tails, attacking um, the uh, the Luftwaffe and, and the uh, Italian air force before they can uh, attack you. It doesn't mean being defensive. Um, it means going out and attacking the lines of supplies. So interdicting ports, uh, interdicting uh, convoys, um, um, places where uh, truck parks are, things like that. And then the third thing they're going to do is assist the army on the battlefield. And that's the third priority. And we're going to see those um, priorities, and they do become priorities in uh, the American doctrine on close air support that was finally rolled out in uh, July 1943 in a uh, field manual 100-20. And, and we'll get to that. But it's very clear that there's three priorities for air support. Air superiority, interdiction, close air support. And uh, we see that coming out of the uh, the British example. So here we get to, to Lightfoot. Um, and uh, I, I've tagged this as the RAF fights the battle their way, the way they want to do it, the way they know how to do it. Um, Conningham is is in charge. Tedder is, is his commander. And they've got way more aircraft. I mean, look at, look at these numbers. Um, 2,469 sorties were conducted before the operation kicked off. And these are these preparing the battlefield. These are um, attacking enemy air bases, attacking ports, attacking lines of communications, doing everything you can possibly do to muddy up the uh, situation for the enemy. Um, and also by having all these uh, taking the battles to the enemy, you're making sure that the enemy can't do what they want to do. They can't interfere behind your lines. They can't attack your marshalling areas. They can't attack your supply lines. They can't send uh, any or even a, a small number of reconnaissance aircraft so that they can get that information that will let them know what's coming or what's about to happen. Absolutely crucial. And these are things that weren't happening during battle acts. Um, the night before the operation kicks off, they're continuing to prepare the battlefield. They're attacking um, troop positions close to the battlefield, not on them. And they're also starting to do electronic warfare, which I think is absolutely fascinating. They've got Wellingtons that have um, jammers, and they're flying behind the battlefields to jam uh, German communications. This continues during the battle itself, and it wreaks havoc with the Germans' ability to, to communicate, to pass information uh, up and back to get reinforcements brought in and, and everything else like that. And it, it really is a, a force multiplier that the RAF um, adds to the battle. And then when we see the battle start on, on the 24th, um, again, they continue to fly those kind of missions that they're good at. They keep attacking um, lines of communication. They're doing what becomes known in Normandy as armed reconnaissance, fly, flying fighter sweeps behind the battlefield, looking for targets of opportunities. 
the uh, the medium bombers um, are going to attack ports and and other supply points behind the lines, and there are some defensive missions being flown, but they're vastly in the minority, and they're also a smaller percentage of the total operations being flown. Um, and this is something we'll see in Normandy as well. In Normandy, they start to do things that weren't done in North Africa or, or were said not to be done in North Africa, but it's a question of numbers. When you have enough aircraft, you can fly a whole bunch of different missions, including ones that are less profitable because uh, you've got enough that you can, I won't say waste, but you can devote those missions that um, aren't as profitable if you've got a, a small resource available to you. So. It's just it's fascinating, you know, you say there, you know, 2,469 sorties before the attack. And I read, I don't know how many chapters I read on Operation Lightfoot, so that first phase of the Second Battle of El Alamein, and, and less than half mention air power at all. I mean, it, 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 the story starts in many books with the artillery bombardment. That's, that's the opening salvo, literally and figuratively, uh, of the Second Battle of Alamein for, for so many uh, of the popular histories. And as an aviation historian who also likes the ground war, is it, is it, is the separation of aviation history and ground history frustrating to you? Is that oh, is those that write about the ground and those that write about the air, but very few bring the two together. Yeah, I was, uh, I was on with um, Brad uh, on uh, a couple days ago um, on this day in Canadian military history, yeah. talking about air power in the Scheldt uh, campaign. Yeah. And it really struck me. And I, I made the same comment there that, Air power historians know the Air Force really well and are great at telling the Air Force story. Army historians know their stuff really well, but there's very few historians, specialists that um, are strong in Army and strong in Air Force and are able to weave those stories together. And I think that's absolutely crucial for an understanding of, of tactical air power. Um, Christopher Rain, I've actually got one of his books in front of me here. Um, which is one of the uh, the excellent books on uh, air power in, in the desert, and I highly recommend it. He's also written a book on, um, uh, it's a study of 29th Tactical Air Command and which army is it? I'm going to get it wrong. 9th Army um, in Northwest Europe. And it's a, a really, for me, it's a model case study in how the army and the air force works together. And I very much want to uh, have one of my future projects being a book, I'm, I would call it air support for first Canadian army mm. and, and look at that um, story of how first Canadian army used 84 group RAF um, from the beaches of, of Normandy right through to the uh, final defeat of Germany. Um, because I think those stories have been told in isolation. People tell the story of the Canadian army, people tell the story of the RAF, but they don't get integrated. And when they do, yeah. there's not enough understanding of the other side to sort of finesse the, the real meaning of these things out. Because uh, if, if you don't understand what's happening on the ground, then it's tough to weave the RAF story into it. So, Well, that's quite like what I'm doing this week is that, you know, the maritime story is coming in on Monday, the aviation is coming in today, and it's trying to trying to weave weave the complete tapestry. But a couple of questions about the, this this beginning of Lightfoot. So you've got the sortie number up there. Lance is asking how many aircraft would that have been? Sorry, how many aircraft, how many aircraft would, were deployed uh, at the beginning of Lightfoot? That's a really good question. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um I, I honestly don't know that. Um, whereas Kalashaw would have had about a dozen squadrons, he's probably, Cunningham's probably got 30 or 40 squadrons. And again, that's just a ballpark figure. But uh, there, there's a lot of aircraft. It's, and, a, it's, a, it's a few hundred, but probably not into a th probably not over a thousand then, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. No, I don't think it would be. Hundreds. Um, the Luftwaffe is really hurting for this battle. Um, they've got... Uh, I think I'd seen something like 30 operational aircraft at the start of the battle. They've got a lot that are uh, sort of having those same problems with um, maintenance and, and repairs that the Italians were having. So a, a large percentage of their aircraft are out of the battle. Now they reinforce as the battle goes on, but at the start, they're completely and utterly overwhelmed by RAF uh, operations. Yeah. And the second question from Trent Telenko, our residence communications wireless and radar expert, is can you ask, Mike, if the RAF fighters had transitioned over to VHF radios by Operation Lightfoot? I think so. I think so, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, I'm curious why you're asking that. Is that 
about uh, being able to have communications between it's the ground. It's bound to be about the net or something. Uh, Trent will follow up that. You know, we'll let him follow up. Yeah. With that. Another um, one, and it's, it's interesting just to we'll, we'll let you ponder that one is because of the, the BBC SAS Rogue Heroes series is about to commence on the 30th of this month. So um, uh, Mike is asking, uh, what effect did the LRDG, SAS, etc. raids play in assisting Allied Air Forces or are they a romantic sideshow? I, I would have to go with the latter. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think they're useful. I think they have their place, but I'm not sure they're directly connected to what's actually happening on the battlefield. Okay, thank you. So we'll, we'll uh, Trent will answer, but I'll hand it back to you. And when Trent comes through with why you asked the question, I'll, I'll put it up there. But let's. Yeah, I, I mean there there wasn't there wasn't a system for for air controllers to talk to uh, aircraft in the air up above. Um, it was. Ex, um, only uh, pre-planned missions that are taking place. So if the Army wanted something to happen, there would be a meeting the evening before uh, the Army and the Air Force would talk. They would figure out what resources were available, what targets needed to be hit, and then aircraft would be assigned. Uh, the orders would go to the squadrons, they'd be briefed, and then that was the end of any kind of input from, from the Army. During the course of the battle, there would be um, forward observers that could um, request missions during the battle, but it was a very a reasonably slow process that would have to go from the front to an army headquarters to an air force to a um, airfield and then dispatch aircraft from the airfield so it, it can happen but it would be very slow okay uh, so he says vhf radios had a 100 mile line of range uh via, compared to a few dozen miles for RAF high frequency radio so yeah range i guess is okay. the issue all right yeah I, I honestly don't know that's uh an area that's outside of my ken trent, trent is is pretty pretty good on that specific um field so uh trent you probably know more than we both know about that well you say um, no more than i, know I think about that's that, safe but, to um, say yeah well back to you mike sure um so Lightfoot was, I mean, I don't need to get into the details here because your other guests are going to cover it much more ably than I am, but I think it really shows how that system of, of uh, air support in the desert has gone from a system that worked really well to a system that was shown to, to fail miserably to build back up to uh, what works. And then the Allies really never looked back um, at, at all. Um, Probably one of the most important meetings that happened in North Africa occurred at, at Tripoli on the 16th of February, 1943. And uh, it was, I think that's at the conclusion of, of most of the fighting in, in North, of North Africa. And uh, all the senior commanders come together, uh, British and American Army and, and Air Force. Uh, Montgomery starts off and uh, you've probably seen that uh, pamphlet that he's issued called uh, Air Power in a Land War or Land Battle, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he kind of gives the, the remarks there, but um, it's very important because what Montgomery has to say is that the air and the land are equally important and they have to work together very closely to have any kind of success in battle. And that's pretty revolutionary coming from uh, an army commander because before that, the vast majority of army commanders, like I I'd said, really want to treat air power as an adjunct, as a, mm -hmm. a supporting arm like the artillery, and to be to have the, the the senior commander stand up and say, "No, we're partners. We're equal. Each has a part to play in the battle." is, is pretty important. And then uh, Cunningham got up and uh, gave his comments. And again, I'm not going to read these to you; they're up there, and you can read them yourself. But essentially, what he's doing is, is talking about what it is the RAF can do in the battle, and he's kind of putting in words the um, the way the RAF has been operating um, since the uh, the post uh, battle axe period that uh, the soldier is the expert in the the land war the airman is the expert in the, the air war and they have to work together to get the job done and uh, he gives a, a couple of very good um, examples of why they have different jobs to do and why air power can't be doing all those jobs that the army wants on the battlefront that they've got a job that goes beyond the battlefront and it might go five miles, 10 miles, a hundred miles behind the front. And it's uh, not divisible in the way that the army uh, front is divisible and splitting it up amongst uh, brigades and, and divisions and corps, but the air force is free flowing over a much bigger area. So it, it, it's, um, um, uh, Vincent Orange, who's written extensively about, he's written a biography of 
Conningham and a biography of Tedder and has written a lot about the RAF, um, said that this appears to be one of the more important speeches that was delivered based on the number of extent copies that are still around today. If you go into the, the papers of a lot of uh, senior commanders, more junior commanders, you'll find a copy of either Montgomery's uh, Air Power in a Land Battle or Conningham's notes from from Tripoli. And it, it, it really speaks to the voice that these uh, comments were given, that they were distributed, that they were shared, they were kept and uh, remain available today. And, that, and that's a really, really important point, because there are lots of things commanders said both during the war and in their in their post-war memoirs that they they insisted when they wrote them were important. But maybe at the time, no one listened and no one cared and they didn't have the reach. But what the fact that these comments are actually being circulated and and digested and are changing policy is is hugely significant, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. And I, I think. um Montgomery's notes were even reissued by the Americans with a forward by um, I forget if it was George Marshall or Hap Arnold or or one of one of those senior uh, leaders, and uh, so it's been distributed through American chains. and And I guess the sort of the last slide I want to end on is is this one, uh, which I think is really important, and I, I've written on this as well. That uh, this is that uh, uh, U.S. War Department Field Manual 100-20 uh, about command and employment of air power, and this this document is is really interesting and really fascinating because it takes all of those british lessons those british ideas and and codifies them for uh the u.s army and the u.s army air forces and uh what what i find most interesting is that the u.s air force the u.s army air forces at the time knew how to do close air support they knew how the things needed to be done but when they got into battle for the first time after operation torch um, they they totally lost control of the situation. The army commanders became um, sort of able to Im impose their will, uh, penny packet the uh, the U.S. Air Forces out to do what they wanted, and uh, there was not a lot of success. And uh, they were using a um, a field manual manual known as thirty one thirty five at the time, which was pretty good, but it was equivocal about who commands. The, the forces in the field and that um, equivocation allowed the army commanders to take over. Um, when 100-20 was issued, um, one uh, WAG called it uh, Declaration of Independence by the uh, the Air Force because it's very clear in saying that, that all those things we've been talking about, that the Air Force has its own role to play and can't be uh, seen as, as secondary to the army. And, uh, well, I mean, the quote I've got there, land power and air power are co-equal and independent forces. Neither is the auxiliary of the others. Like, holy crap, this was revolutionary talk. This was fighting yeah, words. Yeah, that, that's, that's heavy. Yeah. Um, but it, it was based on British success. Um, so what, I, what I've said in the past is that the British didn't know how to do things any better than the Americans did at the time, but they'd had more time to prove it in battle. And they'd been successful in battle. So the, the Western Desert Air Force, the Desert Air Force um, had succeeded in battle. And it was that success that allowed their U.S. Army Air Force partners to say, here's the way we need to be doing it. Um, in the back of their mind, they said, we already knew this, but we can use British success to convince um, our army. You've, you've effectively you've got the data to back it up. In, in exactly. the, when we've done the shows with John Curatola and people like that about the various people at Hap Arnold, a lot of the particularly the 1930s thinking, it's all theoretical, isn't it? It's all it's all the, the 1930s equivalents of powerpoints and flip charts. It's all if we do this, this will happen. But there's absolutely nothing to base it on. It's all yeah. projections I, I, of, of 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 hopes. Whereas yeah. as what you're saying is that there is now actually raw data effective. There's here's how it didn't work. Here's how it got better. And here's how it worked almost seamlessly. There's the model. There's the package. Now to take it and do with it what you can. And that's, that's hugely exactly. significant. And, and then this whole system of air support is then used by the Allies for the rest of the war. And uh, we talked about yeah. it earlier. But um, this system is just packaged and moved wholly into... Normandy and, and through Northwest Europe and becomes the template for tactical air operations um, until the end of the war. And I, I would argue even until today, they figured out how to do it, how to do it right. And these tenets are as practical um, today as they were 
80 years ago. I mean, that, and well, that is that is very, very relevant. And it makes doing these two weeks of shows really important because you know, the North African campaign isn't ha- ha- campaign isn't happening in a bubble. It's not it isn't a, a sideshow that, that ends in 40. Well, it, it physically ends in 42, 43. But the, the ramifications, the improvements, the doctrine, the uh, the air power. And we can talk about the, the, the artillery aspect. We will do the, the engineering as- aspect, the development of mine clearing things that are then taken on to a, a, a huger and better, more successful level without the 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 uh the training ground of actual battle practice of north africa these developments wouldn't have been made so it's this this idea that it's a backwater or a sideshow or a, or a, an unimportant theater it's about empire it's about prestige it's about personal egos batting that they they don't hold any water when you look at the, the improvements uh that were to come yeah very much so and then then i guess i'll just i'll wrap it up and i'm going to throw this slide up again because yeah. um we'll, we'll for, um, circle all the way around to Kalashaw. And now that we've seen this, it makes sense why he thought this was his uh, best effort. Um, I, I would like to say it's the Kalashaw system of, of air support that was used for the rest of the war. I know that'll never get any traction, but what Kalashaw had proven in battle is what worked for the rest of the war and, and the way they did things um, going forward. So it was his best effort. No, well, I'm a thank you for that. And I should be, we should remind people, of course, that your book, it is about the Western Desert and College Shaw's influence, and then you know exactly what you've been talking about tonight, but extended and, and brought on the link to purchasing that book is in the description below. So, folks, we had some pretty um detailed questions earlier on, which we can answer. I know, I know, um, uh, History Explorer wanted to ask one about artillery, um, target marking or something. There's a couple other questions there, so we'll do that now, um, and then yeah, otherwise. We'll, we'll kind of bring things to end at some point, but my, as I expected, as predicted, that was that was that was brilliant. You did exactly what you were supposed to do, and it it is it is, yeah. I've learned a lot, so we'll do questions, folks. And um, in other in other regards, anything else about um? I w- I'll know, just throw that up as well. I'm not sure if people know this book, but Rob Erlers has written an absolutely fantastic book about uh, air power in in the in the Western Desert, um, in the Mediterranean. It goes all the way up through. Sicily and Italy, but it also covers the desert. And I uh, can't recommend that book enough if you want to learn a little bit more about the period. Yeah. Okay. I'll try and go back and find um, History Explorer's question if I can. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's got, there are so many comments coming. I can't scroll back far enough to find it, but we'll hopefully come in. Oh, now the bots are coming in. Now, hang on. I've got to <laughs> the box. Um, uh, I can't find the question from the History Explorer. But um, if you've got any more questions, folks, now the time. But uh, We've talked about the aviation aspect of it, but I can't let you go before we get your assessment as well of Montgomery and Rummel in a paragraph or two, because it's so much of when it gets to Alamein, the desert war, it comes down to the personality. So I've asked everybody else so far. You can, you can, you can't plead the fifth and ignore the question, but you know, and I know because if you're interested in, in, in Normandy, Montgomery is much bigger in your life as an academic than perhaps it was in Craig Tibbetts this morning because he, he never really commands Australians again. But um, the Mike Beck told um, summary of, of Montgomery and Rommel. Yeah, I, uh, and I, I know I'll annoy some people with these comments, but uh, Montgomery, I think is a fantastic commander. Um, I don't think he is a soft, cuddly teddy bear and he's probably not the kind of guy you'd want to go for a pint with. But um, he, he makes the tough decisions. He understands his weapon. He understands uh, its strengths and its weaknesses. And he fights um, to its uh, the best of its abilities uh, for the most part. And I think uh, um, Al Alamein is a great example of that. I know it wasn't his plan, and, and he sort of took a plan and, and uh, put it into effect. But he understood it. He understood the, the strength of the artillery and... And everything like that, and I, I also think he understood the Air Force, and he used the Air Force to its uh, greatest uh, advantage as well. So I, I think Montgomery's a, a really good leader. I think later in the war, he's maybe looking a little bit beyond the end of the war and makes some questionable decisions um, in the face of uh, growing American strength and, and things like that. But that that's that's a different story for another time. Um, Rommel, I think, is an exceptional tactical commander. Um, but he is really over his head as a army commander 
and as a theater commander. I think um, if he was able to be at the front leading his troops, he would have been absolutely fantastic. But he is really got tunnel vision, and he doesn't understand the big picture. He does not understand logistics. I don't think he coordinates his forces as well as Montgomery does. Um, I think he he is a good uh, brigade or divisional commander. Um, I don't think he, I, I think he was promoted above his level of ability. That that frankly is those two assessments are really what's been happening in the, and we're only five shows in, but that is basically how it's going is that Rommel doesn't get logistics and, and, and he's good at what he does, but doesn't do the big picture stuff. Well, we've got the two questions now. So Trent is asking again, did you address in your work, the desert air force fighter control in Egypt? So the kind of centralized commands, is, is that covered? Yeah. It, in Kalashaw's time there, the air force was so small that it wasn't really a big issue. Um, Kalashaw, and I know he gets criticized for this, but he actually did co-locate his headquarters with um, that of Wavell. He had a very close relationship with uh, Wavell and, um, oh, bugger the name. Who's the army commander? That, uh, O'Connor okay. um, that he's working with. <clears throat> and uh, they had a great relationship. Um, he maybe wasn't as far forward as um, Conningham would be later on, and, and that was a factor of, the radio links and the abilities to communicate and things like that. Um, but he did work really well with the, the air force, uh, sorry, with the army. Um, yeah, I, I guess that, does that cover it? Yeah, I think so. And then the question that we had from history explorers is about, it's about, well, I'll read it. Um, so it's about that light operational light foot uh, beginning system there. Did they develop suppression and mark missions in conjunction with artillery by then artillery suppresses AA battery while making a marking a target with smoke for the, for the, the air force to strike. Is that, is that something you know about? Yeah, that's a tactic that's a little bit in the future yet. Right. Um, they were doing some of that. There was some, um, there was an RAAF squadron that was flu- flying Lysanders in uh, in Bardia and, and Compass that was doing some of those kind of markings. But no, those kind of things were a little farther in advance. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we'll leave it at that. But that, that's a, a, a nice 75 minute show. So, folks, two more coming your way tomorrow. So, 8 a.m. UK time, uh, early start. We have uh, Glenn Harper coming on talking about the New Zealanders and their role in the Battle of Alamein. And then Zeta is coming on in the evening to talk about the, 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 the Rommel and uh, Montgomery encounters of December 1942. So four more cracking, or two more cracking shows, then the break of the weekend, then we're back on Monday and we've got South Africa to come, we've got the maritime involvement and uh, a few more things to go. So Mike, it's been a delight talking to you again. We'll have to do another panel discussion about air power again because they're always fun and uh, there's there's... Even since we spoke, there's been more books, more understanding, more assessment, and and it's 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 just one of those subjects that still needs discussion, I think. And 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 the ground air combined arms cooperation generally is something that, as you said yourself, with the writing, is misunderstood, and it's hard to find an expert who's good at both of them. And and you are one of those people. You can do ground and air. So thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us. So brilliant. Thanks, Woody. So, yeah, Always so happy. Mike, it's been great having you again. So thank you. I sorry I spoke over you then. Any, <laughs> any final comment you want to say to the, to the viewers or me? No, no, I'm uh, I'm around. Uh, if anybody has questions, uh, it's Mike underscore Bechtold on on Twitter, and uh, I'm on all the time. And I'm I'm happy to to chat with you about anything you uh, might want to talk about. Brilliant way to end. Okay, thanks then, Mike. Have a good rest of your day, folks. I'll see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye. Yeah, bye.